When the bullet-riddled body of a woman was discovered in a cornfield in Dixon, California on August 3, 1980, authorities were left scratching their heads trying to figure out who the victim could be and what had led her to such a brutal end. With not even her identity known, the case seemed to be nearly impossible. But was this a premeditated murder? Or was the victim in the wrong place at the wrong time? Hello, and welcome back to Mysterious Hook. Today, we take a look at a cold case that has endured for 43 years before DNA could finally link the murder to a suspect with criminal records spanning decades. 20 miles from Sacramento, Dixon was incorporated into Solano County in 1878. Those that call it home get to enjoy a suburban lifestyle without the rush of big city living. It is a farming community known for its alfalfa fields, dairy farms, and sheep farms. Dixon also plays host to the annual Lamb Town Festival and the Mayfair, the oldest state fair in California. In 1980, Dixon became the focus of a crime that shocked the small farming community when the body of a young woman was found in a cornfield. On August 3, 1980, at around 3 p.m., in the height of summer in the United States, two cornfield workers were busy clearing a field near Seavers Road in Dixon. As they made their way through the stalks of corn, on the ground they noticed something unusual. Approaching with abject caution, the men cleared a path and discovered the body of a young woman. Without hesitation, they called their manager, who contacted the police immediately. Within moments, officers from the Solano County Sheriff's Office arrived and cordoned off the scene. It was ruled a homicide as the victim appeared to have been shot multiple times. They searched the immediate area for clues but found nothing. There was nothing belonging to the victim in the area, nor any form of identity. After questioning other workers and potential witnesses, they received no answers to their growing questions. Investigators surmised that the young woman was killed elsewhere and dumped in the cornfield as it was close to the road. The victim's body was taken to the county mortuary for a full autopsy. The cause of death was ruled as homicide by gunshot wounds. She had been shot six times in the head and neck. There were no signs of a sexual assault or defensive wounds. Using the victim's fingerprints, investigators tried to search various databases to find any record that would help identify her. A search of missing person databases didn't provide any leads, nor did the victim have any criminal records. She was named as the Dixon Jane Doe, and a profile was developed with pictures and a composite. In the report, she was described as being white with brown eyes and dark brown hair cut into a punk rock style. She also had a small dark mole on the left side of her chin. The coroner estimated her age to be between 15 and 23. Her height was measured at 5 feet and 2 inches and her weight at 155 pounds. At the time of her death, she was wearing a green wool sweater and a light blue long-sleeved smock with wooden buttons, a small floral design, and a safety pin that was used to secure the top together. On her left finger was a white metal spoon ring, and she was also wearing a wooden bead necklace. Despite the information being made available to all local police departments and sheriff's offices, the victim's case grew cold quickly. The leads dried up and tips were few and far between. Investigators kept checking back with the victim's fingerprints, but nothing was found on any systems. The victim's remains were buried in a Solano County cemetery a month after the body was discovered and marked as a Dixon Jane Doe. The case grew cold. Periodically, investigators would look through the file. It was ten years later they received a new lead, on June 19, 1992, the Solano County Sheriff's Office received new information regarding the Dixon Jane Doe case. The National Missing Persons Unit contacted the investigation team regarding a missing persons report made by Augustine and Sally Campilia on May 12, 1992. 
they reported that their daughter, 21-year-old Holly Ann Campilia, went missing in July 1980. According to the Campilia family, they had reported Holly Ann missing in July 1980 after receiving a letter from her that stated she did not want to have any more contact with them. They tried to trace the address on the letter but discovered that it was from a fake street address. Holly Ann's parents then discovered that the missing persons report that they filed initially in July 1980 was somehow deleted from the national database two weeks after it was made. Having received the new information, investigators ran the details received through the database. They also requested DNA samples to test against that of their Jane Doe. Five weeks later, the Campilia family received the devastating news that Holly Ann was, in fact, the Dixon Jane Doe. Holly Ann Campilia was born in 1959 to parents Augustine and Sally Campilia. She was the eldest of five daughters and raised in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. She was a free spirit, according to her family, and always cheerful. She adored her sisters and often sewed their dresses and helped with styling their hair. Her father, Augustine, said she was a talented and artistic person. Life had seemed to be on track for Holly Ann as she was performing well in school, scoring straight A's. However, it was in her senior year in 1976 that Holly Ann began to change. Her parents noticed her withdrawing from the family and then discovered she had started abusing substances. They also noticed the change in her mental health and her emotional breakdowns. What they couldn't understand was the root cause of her problems. Despite her personal problems, Holly Ann went on to enroll at the Glassboro State College studying toward a degree in fine arts. It was then that she started to behave erratically again. Holly Ann began running away from home. The first incident occurred in 1977. She disappeared for over a month before her parents found her, walking along Route 70 about a mile from their home. Over the next few years, Holly Ann continued her pattern of running away from home and becoming less responsive to the medical treatment she was receiving for her emotional problems. Her mother Sally said that Holly Ann needed to be watched at all times or she absconded from home constantly. Holly Ann's family tried desperately to make sure they gave her all the help possible. The last time she saw her daughter alive was June 10, 1980, while they were on their way to a counseling center. Holly Ann began to grow agitated, and while her mother drove, she started to have an outburst, insisting she needed to do things her way and see the world. Holly Ann tried opening the door as her mother drove. Sally pulled the car over to the side of the road to reason with Holly Ann, who immediately walked away. Despite trying to pull her back, Sally could not hold on to her daughter. Sally immediately returned home and called the Cherry Hill Police to report Holly Ann missing. They provided assistance by stopping several girls who looked like Holly Ann, but it was too late. She had already made her way out of town. A month later, they received a letter from Holly Ann addressed from Sacramento. According to the letter, Holly Ann said she was living with two guys and told her parents not to think of her anymore. A trace of the address led them nowhere. It was then they reported her missing and had her name and profile uploaded to the missing persons database. Little did they know, her details were accidentally erased from the system. The Campilia family turned to other missing persons networks and social security to see if Holly Ann had somehow turned up somewhere on their radars. For years, her family waited for answers. I just kept hoping she would show up one day with grandchildren, but with each year, I'd lose a little hope, said Sally. After 12 years of holding out hope, the Campilia family had finally found Holly Ann and in a way received the closure they needed. My daughter said to me, Mom, Holly gave us 12 years to get used to this, said Sally. With each year, we lost a little hope. In a way, knowing what happened to her is some kind of relief, she said. Holly Ann's remains were flown back to New Jersey from California for her final burial in 1992. Sally remarked that it would be the first and last time Holly Ann would be on a plane. She could never wait for a plane. She either hitchhiked or took a bus. 
When they send her body home, it will be the first time she was ever on a plane. And the last. Investigators now had a name for the victim and worked with Holly Ann's family to find answers to her murder. Having not heard from her in over 12 years, they could offer no new information that would help the case. They were back to square one. No new leads meant no moving forward with the investigation. The case went cold again. As the case sat cold, the family began looking at the new technology that was being introduced to solve cold cases. In 2021, Holly Ann's sisters approached the Solano County Sheriff's Office to find out if it was possible to retest all the biological evidence that was collected from the crime scene and Holly Ann's body. The Sheriff's Office reviewed the case and resubmitted the evidence. Fortunately, the evidence was preserved properly. Advancements in technology allowed for the biological material to be tested despite how old the samples were. The DNA samples were sent to the Serological Research Institute, who were able to discover a foreign DNA profile. The lab results confirmed that the foreign DNA found on several pieces of evidence was that of a male. With a new DNA profile, officials submitted their new findings to the San Mateo Crime Lab in California. They soon discovered that the DNA profile was already on their system and belonged to a man already doing serious time in prison, Herman Lee Hobbs. 76-year-old Herman Lee Hobbs was already serving time at the Valley State Prison in Chowchilla. Hobbs had lived in Sacramento and worked as a mechanic. Reports suggest that he was married to a woman named Louise Hobbs and had children with her. Hobbs was alleged to have been a drug user and also involved in manufacturing methamphetamine for his own use. There is not much information regarding his personal life, but Hobbs's criminal history is extensive and disturbing. In 1969, at age 22, Hobbs was apprehended after leading police on a wild car chase following a spate of robberies in Sacramento. He admitted to being responsible for more than a dozen robberies and agreed to plead guilty to being the serial burglar. However, during his sentencing, he attempted to escape from the courtroom and had to be tackled and subdued by courthouse officers. He was released in 1975 after serving just five years, but the worst was still to come. In the year 2000, Hobbs's criminal career came to a crashing end. He was convicted of assaulting a female from Yuba County, California. Following his conviction, his own daughter and niece came forward with a tip that Hobbs may be responsible for numerous fatal attacks between 1975 and 2000. Investigators looked back at several cold cases and were able to identify Hobbs's movement since his release. In January 1975, 13-year-old Terry Pata had left school early after complaining of feeling sick with a headache. She never made it home. Her body was found nine days later, stuffed in a drain pipe along the route she normally took home. She had been fatally wounded with a knife. Investigators discovered that Hobbs had moved to Rio Linda in 1975 and lived only a block away from Terry's home. With Hobbs's DNA already on file, they tested it against the evidence from Terry's murder and found a positive match. Hobbs was already serving a lengthy sentence for the Yuba County case from 2000. He pleaded no contest to Terry's murder and was given another sentence of 25 years to life. Another cold case resurfaced following Hobbs's arrest. In the year 2000, loggers working near the Yuba County foothills discovered the skull of a woman. The remains were sent off to an anthropology lab in California for DNA testing. The results proved that the skull belonged to 29-year-old Brenda Ann Tucker, who was reported missing in May 1994. Her clothes were found neatly folded by a creek in the Rackerby area, and her car was discovered in a parking lot of a Brownsville market. Brenda was classified as missing until December 2000. After the results from the autopsy, it was proved that it was a gunshot to the back of her head that killed her. Furthermore, witnesses came forward after the discovery, claiming that Brenda was murdered. The case went to trial while Hobbs was serving his sentence for Terry's murder. Yuba County Detective Sergeant Phil Spadini testified at the trial. 
In court, he said that witnesses claimed to have seen Brenda leave Hobbs's residence shortly before he too was seen leaving. He also said the clothing belonging to Brenda was found about a half a mile from the home he shared with his wife Louise in 1994 and included a towel from Hobbs's own home. He further added that Brenda's remains were found a short distance from where Hobbs lived in 1984. Spadini also brought forth two calls received from women in Yuba County that alleged Hobbs assaulted them, one of which said her assault occurred near the woods where Brenda's remains were found. Brenda's family said that Hobbs knew them well and was often a house guest during the 1990s. DNA found on the black pants that Brenda was last seen wearing proved to be a match to Hobbs. But on September 17, 2002, during his arraignment, a judge dismissed the case, stating that there was insufficient evidence to link Hobbs to Brenda's murder. Investigators were also looking into a possible link between Herman Lee Hobbs and the disappearance of 35-year-old Jennifer Lynn Wallace from Dobbins in Yuba County. Jennifer was reported missing by her estranged husband in November 1997 after failing to meet him as scheduled. In 2023, Hobbs's name resurfaced after DNA found at the Holly Ann Campilia crime scene matched his own during the reinvestigation of the case. A warrant was issued to obtain Hobbs's DNA in order to confirm a direct match. It proved to be a positive match to the male DNA profile found on the evidence. Hobbs was charged and arrested on February 24, 2023 for the murder of Holly Ann Campilia. He was transferred from the state prison to Solano County Jail. He is being held without bail and on a state prisoner hold. Hobbs is set to be arraigned on March 13, 2023 in the Solano County Superior Court in Fairfield. Investigators are currently working on investigating five other cases that may be linked to Herman Lee Hobbs. Following the confirmation of Hobbs' involvement in the death of Holly Ann Campilia, the Sheriff's Department released a statement thanking the Campilia family and the investigators working the case. We are grateful to the Campilia family for their patience and assistance to the labs whose new technology allowed additional testing of older evidence, and to the staff who worked tirelessly to help bring closure to a lifetime of waiting," they said in a statement. Sadly, Holly Ann's sister Karen died aged 47 on June 11, 2009 from natural causes. On July 3, 2016, her mother Sally Campilia also died at age 83 without knowing who was responsible for her daughter's murder. The Solano County Sheriff's Office said that detectives are still working with other agencies in Northern California to identify and possibly link Hobbs to other cold cases and possible victims. For investigators who take on the challenge of cold cases, it becomes a job motivated by determination, dedication, and a responsibility to the families of the victims to see a case through to the end, no matter how many years it takes to find answers. In the case of Holly Ann Campilia, her family's need for answers may be able to bring closure to many other families who may have lost loved ones to the evil motives of Herman Lee Hobbs. Mid-July 1980 was the peak of the American summer. As the rest of the country battled the heat, law enforcement officials in Kern and Ventura County, Central California, were left to deal with two homicides occurring within days of each other on July 15th and 18th. It was a murder mystery that remained unsolved for decades before DNA technology provided the missing links that gave investigators the edge needed to catch a depraved killer. But who were the victims, and how were they connected? Sun, sand, surf, and mountains. From golden shores to glamorous cities, California has it all and more. The West Coast State is undeniably a year-round attraction for tourists from all over the world. Whether you want to enjoy an afternoon taking in the bustling atmosphere of Venice Beach, or spend a day rubbing shoulders with celebrities in sun-kissed Los Angeles as you stroll down the Walk of Fame, California has a little something for everyone. But despite its magnetic charm, California also has its share of dark history. And today, we take a look at two such mysteries. 
On the morning of July 15, 1980, a group of maintenance workers in Delano, California made their way through the almond orchard for another day of work. As they approached the 13th row of trees, they took notice of what appeared to be a person curled up in a fetal position asleep on the ground. Curiosity compelled them to inspect further, and what they discovered left them reeling and rushing off to contact police immediately. It was the body of a woman who had clearly been murdered. Teams of investigators and crime scene technicians arrived at the almond plantation and began cordoning off the area to begin their investigation. The woman appeared to be of either Native American or Hispanic descent. Investigators immediately noted the lack of blood at the scene and soon found tire tracks that led up to and then away from where the body was found. Another clue was a discarded Michelob beer bottle. They theorized that their victim may have been picked up from a bar known as Ruby's, located in Lamore, an hour away from the farm. Their investigation began immediately as they searched the plantation for clues to her identity. Detectives were dispatched to Ruby's to question staff and patrons of the identity of the woman or any suspicious activity, while other teams combed through the fields. By the afternoon, investigators had not found any of her personal belongings, and the people that were questioned by detectives were unable to provide much information about the woman. The body was transported to the county mortuary for a post-mortem examination. Examiners determined she had been murdered a day before being discovered. She had been assaulted before being stabbed. It was overkill, with a total of 27 stab wounds. 18 to the chest and 9 defensive wounds on her arms and shoulders. For investigators, it was obvious she fought fiercely against her attacker. Her cause of death was recorded as sharp force trauma as her vital organs had been punctured. Without any form of identification, her fingerprints were taken and sent to the crime lab. However, after running her prints through various databases, there were no records found. The coroner began examining the body for clues that investigators could use in trying to identify her. She had two unique tattoos. One was a heart with the words, I love you, Shirley, and Seattle. The other simply read, Mother, and I love you. Scars were found on her abdomen, which the examiner believed may have come from an operation or childbirth, and there was scarring on her buttocks. She also wore a prosthetic left leg due to an injury on her upper leg. Her entire set of upper teeth were missing and showed signs of being removed medically. The toxicology report showed that she had been intoxicated with a blood alcohol level of 0.3%. This strengthened the theory that she was possibly picked up from the bar rubies. A detailed profile was developed based on the examiner's findings. She was estimated to be between the ages of 25 to 35 and weighed 115 pounds with a height of 5 feet and 4 inches. She had black hair that was slightly curled and was of Native American descent. Her body showed signs of possibly having given birth at least once. The tattoo suggested that she was a native of Seattle, Washington, and that Shirley was either her real name or that of someone she loved dearly. The clothes she was wearing at the time of her death were a pink top, blue jeans, white shoes, and blue socks. Her body was kept in the county mortuary until she could properly be identified and was given the placeholder name of Kern County Jane Doe. Investigators had also lifted fingerprints from the discarded beer bottle found at the scene and made plaster impressions of the tire tracks found near the victim's body. The forensics team had also taken the clothes of the victim and were able to extract biological material from the items. They also commissioned the medical examiner to provide the nail clippings of the victim in order to test for possible DNA that may have been transferred during the attack. These were all sent for DNA profiling while the investigation continued. But she was just the first victim in what was going to become a decades-long mystery. Three days after the discovery of the Kern County Jane Doe, law enforcement officials were alerted to another murder in neighboring Ventura County. The body of another female was discovered in the Thousand Oaks High School parking lot on July 18, 1980 in Westlake. When investigators arrived, they noted that the woman was either of Native American or Hispanic descent. 
She had been partially disrobed and had several visible defensive wounds on her arms. A search of the crime scene indicated that she was murdered elsewhere as there was no significant amount of blood near the scene. It was also believed that she was brought to the parking lot and dragged from a vehicle as there was a trail of blood from the edge of the tarmac surface to where the body was found. Investigators were aware that a similar attack had occurred three days prior in neighboring Kern County. Although the similarities were striking between both crime scenes, at the time, investigators did not believe they were linked. A search of the nearby area provided no clues for investigators, as there were no tire tracks to be found and no personal belongings of the victim located near the crime scene. The school custodian who had found the body was questioned, but he could not provide any further details except that he had found her while going about his general duties at the school. It was unmistakable to investigators at the time that she was also pregnant. Her body was sent off to the county coroner for a further examination. At the coroner's office, the medical examiner determined that the victim had been killed 12 hours before her body was discovered. She had been stabbed 16 times and then strangled to death. The victim had also suffered a brutal assault. The wounds on her arm showed that she had fought her attacker to the very end. The coroner determined that she was between the age range of 20 to 30. Her estimated height was between 5 feet 1 to 5 feet 3 inches and weighed between 100 to 115 pounds. The coroner provided investigators with a detailed profile that included her description and distinguishable marks on her body. The victim was primarily Native American with some Hispanic, Caucasian, Sub-Saharan, and Asian ancestry. She had brown eyes, black hair with bleach blonde tips, and penciled eyebrows as she had shaved her natural brows off. She had a large amount of dental work done and also had pierced ears. She had several scars and birthmarks, including two vaccination scars on her left arm and a scar on the left knee. They were able to determine that she was five months pregnant with a male child. The baby had appeared to be well-nourished and received proper prenatal care prior to the attack. An episiotomy scar also suggested she may have given birth to at least one child before this. Her fingerprints were taken and a search through national databases came up empty. Like the Kern County Jane Doe, she too had no criminal history. The victim had been clothed in a white t-shirt, black bra, white underwear, and red pants. These, along with her fingernail clippings, were all taken and sent off to extract any foreign DNA that could be used to identify her murderer. DNA had also been extracted from the unborn child to conduct a paternity test. While investigators waited on the results, the county coroner gave her the placeholder name Ventura County Jane Doe. Over the next few weeks, authorities in both Kern County and Ventura County worked extensively to uncover the identities of both women. Kern County officials revisited the bar and interviewed more people in and around the area. Investigators also made use of the local media to appeal to anyone who may have known either Jane Doe. It was then that they received a tip from an anonymous female caller who alleged to have known the woman found in the orchard. According to the caller, she went by the name Becky or Rebecca Ochoa, had tattoos similar to that of the victim, and she worked as a waitress at a bar. However, this tip led nowhere. Other people came forward claiming that she had been seen in and around Lamore for several weeks before her death. According to these witnesses, the victim had worked at a local apple orchard as a farmhand. This lead, too, failed to produce any useful information in the end. Investigators then took to visiting local tattoo parlors, hoping they would recognize the work and be able to identify the victim. A tattoo artist from Bakersfield said that he did not know the work personally, but provided details to a Los Angeles tattoo parlor that used a similar technique in their designs. He also explained that the area had a large community of Native Americans. Following this lead, detectives set off for Los Angeles. After questioning the artists in the parlor, they realized that their Jane Doe did not have any links to the area, and they were now back at square one. In Ventura County, detectives worked with the theory that their Jane Doe had been kidnapped while hitchhiking near the College of Sequoias in Visalia, California. 
Investigators also used the media as a way to discover more information about their victim. But unlike the Kern County Jane Doe, no one seemed to recall their victim. Her dental records were distributed to several dental labs, but there was still no match. Without any new leads, these avenues were quickly drying up. Investigators' hopes were dashed again when the paternity tests from the unborn child also proved to be a dead end. The DNA extracted from the unborn child was used to create a profile that could be linked to existing criminal profiles of the CODIS database. However, it seemed that the child's father did not have a criminal history. DNA testing was still in its infancy in the 1980s, and investigators had exhausted every lead possible in trying to identify both women. Both the Jane Doe's were buried in county cemeteries, but their stories were not forgotten by the investigators who continued to work to restore their identities. The foreign DNA from both women was discovered to be that of an unknown male, Investigators, though, continued to keep both investigations separate, believing the murders were pure coincidence. This was filed away, and over the next 30 years, DNA results would periodically be submitted by investigators, who were given the reins of the cold cases in both counties. A fresh set of eyes meant a new approach to the case. Investigators were sure that the murderer would have committed more crimes since 1980. With technological advancements, it was possible their suspect was now on their systems. In 2008, Kern County officials were finally able to find a match to the DNA recovered from their Jane Doe. It had been linked to a 51-year-old man named Wilson Chuist, who was already in custody in California. Wilson Claude Chuist Jr. was born on December 2, 1951, in New Orleans, Louisiana. According to reports, Wilson's childhood was tough as his parents were always at odds with each other. When he was younger, Wilson had a desire to become a priest. But after being expelled from a Catholic school for beating another student, those ambitions were dashed. He soon gave in to the darker side of life and began abusing drugs. At the age of 18, he enrolled in the army but was discharged after being deemed unsuitable for service. After returning home, Wilson decided to get married and settle down in Los Angeles in 1969. The couple seemed happy enough and even had a daughter. But cracks in the marriage appeared as Wilson turned to a life of crime. His first major crime occurred in October 1977. He had given a lift to a young woman who had been standing on the side of a road in Los Angeles. Once she got in, he then abducted her and drove her to a remote location. Wilson then assaulted her and attempted to strangle her to death. He assumed she died after she had fallen unconscious. After he left her body in a ditch, she regained her senses and immediately reported him to the nearest police station. Unable to escape the charges, Wilson made a deal with the prosecutors and was charged with abduction in November 1977. He was paroled in June 1980. It wouldn't last long, though. In August 1980, just two months after his release, he committed a robbery. That same month, he attempted to abduct another woman outside the College of Sequoias in Visalia. He had threatened her with violence if she refused to cooperate, but his plan was foiled by two witnesses who were walking by at the same time. In September 1980, he went on to abduct and assault another woman who he released after she told him she was married. He was ultimately caught and convicted for all three crimes. He was sentenced to 12 years to life in prison that same year. Wilson, though, was paroled in 2004 after serving 24 years, but the committee reversed their decision after concluding that he showed no remorse. He was, however, eligible for another parole hearing in 2016. While still behind bars, investigators were able to link Wilson's DNA to that of the DNA profile recovered from the Kern County Jane Doe. However, he was not immediately charged, and there was never a reason given for this. In 2012, having heard how officials in Kern County linked Wilson to an unsolved murder from July 1980, Ventura County officials submitted the DNA profile of their cold case suspect to CODIS to test against any possible matches to convicts already on the system. In January 2013, they had a match. 
There, Jane Doe had also been linked to Wilson Chuest through DNA found on her clothes and fingernails. It baffled investigators in both counties as they had spent all these years investigating both cases whose similarities were striking but never linked. The fight for justice, though, was far from over. Although DNA had linked Wilson to both murders, it had still not been able to identify both the Jane Doe's. When the case was brought to the district attorney's office in Ventura County, one of the attorneys opted not to pursue the cold case with unknown victims. Senior Deputy District Attorney John Barrick, though, was not willing to give up. He wanted to prosecute Wilson for the murders of both Kern County and Ventura County Jane Doe's. Under the laws of murder, I don't have to prove their identity. I just have to prove that they're a human being. I thought it was worth the effort. Because if we don't, then these women will never get the justice they deserve, even if we don't know their names. And there's a good possibility that Wilson is going to get out, and that is not a person who deserves to be out among law-abiding citizens, said Barrick. While still in custody, Wilson Chuist was transferred to Ventura County on September 23, 2015 by a court order. While being held at the county jail, he was charged and arrested with three counts of murder, the deaths of both Jane Doe's and the death of the unborn child of Ventura County Jane Doe. From the outset, Wilson denied all responsibility for the assault and murders of both women. For the next three years, Barrick, along with several prosecutors from both Kern County and Ventura County, worked to provide a compelling argument that would see Wilson pay for his crimes. His trial began on May 14, 2018. Three of the women who survived his attacks testified in court and described Wilson as being predatory in nature. Their testimonies were similar in the way they had been approached by Wilson and lured into his car. Another witness who came forward was Patrick Scott Bell. Patrick had been a teenager in 1980 and had often stayed with Chuist, who was a family friend. He told the court of how Wilson had confessed to him that he had killed and dumped the body of an unknown woman. He also explained that he and his brothers had helped Wilson clean his car one evening, and when confronted by their mother, Carolyn Bell lied that Wilson had hit a deer. This confession was corroborated by Carolyn Bell both in a previous interview from 2013 and in court. After the confessions, prosecutors then used physical evidence that was found at the Kern County crime scene. DNA and fingerprints taken from the discarded beer bottle had been previously matched to Wilson. The DNA extracted from the Jane Doe's clothes and fingernails also proved a positive match. Wilson's defense attorney, Andre Nintchev, presented a weak argument by stating his client and the women had consented to intimacy. He also argued that there was no physical evidence from the Ventura County crime scene to prove Wilson was actually there. After a two-week-long trial, Wilson was found guilty of the murders of both adult victims on May 31, 2018. The jury voted unanimously in favor of a guilty verdict. However, they could not convict him for the murder of the unborn child as the laws referenced by the prosecution in order to find him guilty of the murder were only changed after 1994. The death penalty was not pursued due to Wilson's age and the lack of witnesses testifying on his behalf. On July 12, 2018, Wilson was sentenced to serve two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. He is currently serving out his sentence at the California Substance Abuse Treatment Facility and State Prison in Corcoran. Although Wilson was convicted and charged in the murders of both Jane Doe's, it did not bring investigators any closer to giving them their names back. But DNA testing had now advanced substantially since the 1980s. In Ventura County cold case investigator Steve Rhodes knew that a new genetic genealogy testing method was being used to identify suspects from decades-old cold cases. It had put the Golden State Killer behind bars. It could surely help identify the victims. In partnership with the DNA Doe Project, DDP, an all-volunteer group that makes use of genetic genealogy to identify John and Jane Doe's, both the Kern County and Ventura County officials submitted their DNA samples for genetic testing. 
The DDP has been credited with positively identifying a victim of serial killer John Wayne Gacy. So far, the DDP has been able to find locations and surnames of distant relatives that may be related to the Ventura County Jane Doe. These have been listed on their website and Facebook page and include Southern Texas, Central Mexico, Northern New Mexico, Indigenous California, and Guatemala. She has still not been identified by relatives. In 2021, investigators were able to find the father of her unborn child. It is believed he is an immigrant from Honduras who had ties to the Central American community within the Koreatown district of Los Angeles. Investigators were unable to make contact with him and get any information regarding their Jane Doe. They are, however, actively pursuing any leads and are urging relatives to come forward to volunteer their DNA. The Kern County Jane Doe proved a bit more difficult as the DNA retrieved had degraded over time and it took a while to find anything that could be used. Her investigation began in May 2019. The DDP found that the victim was indigenous with parents likely from Macwachese, Alberta, Canada. The problem was that a very few indigenous people had provided their DNA profiles to genealogy websites. An appeal was made on the DDP Facebook page requesting people of indigenous ancestry to upload their DNA in order to help solve the case. This appeal was seen by Violet Suse, who had been searching for her missing aunt, Shirley Ann Suse, for decades. Violet submitted her DNA to GED Match in February 2020. After, testing confirmed that Violet was in fact a close relative of the Kern County Jane Doe. The DNA Doe Project made the announcement in April 2021 that Shirley Ann Suse had finally been identified. She was 35 years old when she was murdered. Shirley was born on February 6, 1945 on the Sampson Cree Nation Reserve in Alberta, Canada. She had seven siblings who were all part of a close-knit family unit. Shirley was just 14 years old when her father passed away. This caused financial difficulties as the family could not handle the responsibilities of maintaining their ranch. She chose to eventually leave the reservation in search of a job to support her family. Shirley initially intended to move to the nearby city of Edmonton, but ended up moving to Vancouver, British Columbia. Here, she would eventually get married to a man named Adam Miscu in 1963 and gave birth to two boys and a girl. But life did not get any easier. After a turbulent few years, her marriage ended and all three of her children were taken away and placed in foster care before being adopted. She was unable to regain custody of her children and became homeless. Shirley turned to alcohol and substance abuse to cope with her depression. She sometimes returned to Alberta, but her family had noticed the change in her personality. The last time she was seen by her relatives was in 1977 when she returned for her brother's funeral. She expressed her desire to not return to Alberta, but did mention that she would be visiting a friend in Seattle, Washington. Allegedly, it was Shirley's mother who asked her daughter to get tattoos that would distinguish her from other people and make it easy to identify her if something happened. Shirley maintained contact with her family through letters, but that ceased after June 1980. Family members searched the Vancouver area for decades, but eventually resorted to visiting cemeteries, believing she had died. Following the discovery, Violet Suse said that she had made her grandmother a promise to find Shirley and return her to the family. Her remains were flown to Edmonton Airport on May 26, 2022. Before her casket was returned to her family, members of the Thule River Tribe of California held a ceremony with blessings and songs. Officials from the Kern County Sheriff's Office joined them in saying their final goodbye. For Violet, it was a relief to finally fulfill the promise she made. Shirley Ann Suse was laid to rest at her family's resting place in Riverside Cemetery on May 27, 2022. Violet now encourages indigenous people to train in DNA research so they too can conduct their own forensic investigations. She continues to work with investigators to help other indigenous families find their missing loved ones through a genetic genealogy database.
That is the hope I want to give to people in similar situations as mine, she said. As impossible as the task seemed in 1980, investigators' fervent pursuit of justice combined with the advancements made in DNA technology and testing has finally brought a killer to justice and peace to family who had been searching for far too long for their loved one. So far, more than half the battle has been won, but as technology progresses, hope remains in identifying the Ventura County Jane Doe. Today's case has proven that dogged determination can lead to amazing results. What are your thoughts on the progress made by technology in helping identify and bring closure to families who have spent years searching for answers about the whereabouts of their missing loved ones? On January 23, 1971, a small group of hunters stumbled across a canvas sack abandoned in the middle of the desert. Believing they'd found another man's catch, they opened it up to take a look inside, but were horrified to find the body of a woman. Little did anyone know what was to come in the years that followed. Who could this woman have been? Why was she killed? Mojave County is the second largest county in the state of Arizona, with its first inhabitants being the Mojave people. In the 1860s, Mojave County became known as a booming gold mining area and was used as a recreation town by miners and soldiers. But as industry developed, people began to move further away. The Great Depression brought with it a renewed interest in the gold rush. These days, Mojave has become a booming tourist destination as many flock to the national parks and use the area as a quick access route to the Grand Canyon, Route 66, and Hoover Dam. But half a century ago, Mojave County was the scene for a murder mystery that still haunts the Sheriff's Department to this day. On January 23, 1971, a group of three hunters were looking for game in a remote desert area in Mojave County, Arizona, when they came upon a canvas sack abandoned in the desert. The sack was loosely tied with a white cotton rope and left along the Hackberry Gravel Road in the isolated desert. It bore the words, Deer Pack Ames Harris Neville Co. printed on the side in green. Assuming it was an animal carcass left behind by another group of hunters, they opened the sack to investigate. To their shock and horror, they found the contorted body of a woman. The police were called to the scene immediately, and they sealed off the area to begin their investigation. It was obvious to investigators that they were dealing with a homicide. Whoever wrapped the victim up in the sack was clearly trying to hide the body. It was also clear that the woman had been murdered elsewhere and her remains unceremoniously dumped in the desert two miles from the U.S. 93 highway near Kingman in Arizona. It was becoming apparent that the case was going to be an uphill challenge for investigators and firstly, they needed to determine who the victim was and secondly, where the actual crime took place. Having canvassed the immediate area for any clues or possible belongings of the victim, investigators came up empty-handed. No identification, no bag, and no purse were found anywhere near the crime scene. It seemed like whoever killed her had made sure not to leave any incriminating clues behind and made a clean getaway. Investigators sent her body away to the Mojave County Coroner's Office for a post-mortem while they continued to question the hunters about any suspicious activity in the area. It was obvious from the beginning that the woman was a victim of homicide as she had been stuffed into a canvas sack. Her cause of death, though, baffled investigators. Although her neck was broken, decomposition had already set in making it difficult to determine if there were any ligature marks around her neck. It was initially listed as unknown, as she showed no signs of blunt force trauma or gunshot wounds. There were also no signs of a health-related death, such as a stroke or heart attack, and her organs were listed as healthy. Toxicology reports also suggested no drugs or alcohol in her system that may have led to an accidental overdose. Much later in the investigation, the cause of death status was changed to strangulation based on the theory that she may have been murdered by someone she knew personally, perhaps a lover or spouse. It was also difficult to pinpoint the time of death, as her body had been partially frozen 
but they estimate that she could have been killed any time between December 1st and 31st, 1970, toward the end of bull hunting season. They begin working on creating a workable profile for investigators to use to solve the mystery. It was determined that the victim was a white female, aged between 35 to 40 years old. Her height was estimated at 5 foot 4 inches, and her weight between 125 and 140 pounds. Her hair was brownish black and short with curls. Examiners added that she had scarring on her abdomen, consistent with a cesarean section birth, and internal signs indicated she may have been a mother of three children. They determined she may have been married, as a bone indentation was visible on her left ring, showing that she had once used a wedding band. But no jewelry was found on her body. She did not smoke, and lima beans were discovered in her digestive system as the last meal she had eaten. Her clothes were added to the description and included a multicolored size 14 blouse with five brass buttons and the pallets and a long sleeve black cardigan. She wore size 12 burnt orange stretch pants with the label Symphony is what's happening stitched on the inside. On her feet were pixie style black leather boots that were a size five and a half and bobby socks that were possibly white at some point. Her hair was described as being salon styled and her appearance clean and meticulous. Her nails were evenly manicured and clean. What stood out was the extensive dental work she had done. She was missing two molars and had a $500 Maryland bridge for dental implants fitted in. It was estimated she had work done on her teeth to the value of almost $2,100. She was given the placeholder name, the Mojave Jane Doe, and kept at the county mortuary until her identity could be determined. A composite drawing was made of the Jane Doe by a Flagstaff police sketch artist, but it remained businesslike and unflattering. This was given to investigators, along with the descriptions from the medical examiner. Using this information, investigators worked tirelessly to identify the woman. The first thing the investigators did was place a report in both the local and national papers with a description composite sketch and area the victim was found. It did not seem to bring in any promising leads, so they turned their attention to other methods of identification. Given that she seemed to be well-groomed, without any signs of neglect, investigators canvassed motels, hotels, and local stores in the area that catered to the upper middle class. Although they questioned people extensively, no one could remember such a woman crossing their paths. Investigators then looked at her clothing, and tried to determine from where she had bought her clothes. A visit to all possible clothing outlets produced negative results. Investigators then turned to airports and conducted searches of flight manifestos, questioning staff about any person who had not been accounted for on any flight, and followed up with those leads. This too led nowhere. Next, investigators took to placing a missing person's advert in dental magazines, explaining the scope of the work she had done on her teeth. This they hoped would jog the memory of the dentist who performed the surgeries and they would come forward with her identity. When this option failed, they went through the filing system of a dentist lab in Phoenix, Arizona. After searching through files of over 8,000 patients, they had still come up short. Investigators widened their nets and set out the missing persons bulletin to Arizona, California, Nevada, and Utah. 23 women had been reported missing during that time period, but all were eventually found alive. The Jane Doe, however, was not among any of those reported missing. Investigators made a request for the fingerprints that were taken for record purposes during the autopsy. These were then sent off to the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Washington to be checked against the national database, COITUS. But still there was no trace of her on any system, missing or criminal. Investigators eventually turned to looking for a suspect among the hunting community, especially those who applied for hunting licenses during that particular season. Over 5,000 applications had been made and each and every person was tracked down and questioned. Sheriff Floyd Sisney, Sergeant Don Parrish, and Detective Joe Chapin surmised that their Jane Doe may have been murdered by a spouse. Each applicant who was married was asked to produce their wife for questioning. This too ended up producing no results. The three men strongly believed that the murder was what they called a mama-papa killing, 
by an enraged husband. In speaking with local reporters, Sisney said he believed that eventually her identity would be revealed, as she may have children according to the autopsy reports. And somewhere out there, her children are missing their mother and being stalled by their father in search for her. But they'll start worrying before long. Time has a habit of solving murder mysteries, he said. The extensive investigation had covered every possible avenue, but investigators remained hopeful. Said Sisney, we're still no closer to finding this woman's identity, but somebody out there must have seen her, may even know her, or may remember a small thing that could help us. Although the search for the identity of the Mojave Jane Doe continued in earnest with nationwide interest, no new leads developed. Given all the clues and descriptions, no one ever came forward to claim the victim or report her missing. After three months of waiting, authorities eventually buried the Mojave Jane Doe at the Mountain View Cemetery in Kingman, a county cemetery used by the department for unclaimed bodies within Mojave County. Her headstone was simply marked Jane Doe, with her date of death as January 29, 1971. Months turned to years, then to decades. Thirty years later, in 2001, Lori Miller, an investigator for the Special Investigation Unit, SIU, was given the task of identifying the Mojave Jane Doe. The SIU was formed in 1999 as a part of the Mojave County Sheriff's Department initiative to investigate, solve, and eventually close cold cases that had been piling up over the years. By that year alone, there were over 60 unsolved cases, the oldest being the Mojave Jane Doe. It was a painstaking process for Miller and her team as they began the investigation. Like their predecessors, Miller along with several other investigators reviewed old case files and reports. They re-interviewed possible witnesses hoping to refresh their memories and maybe pick up some new information and clues. They resubmitted the fingerprints and once again went back to the dental records to find the dentist possible for working on the Jane Doe, but it didn't produce the desired results. Miller and her team also reached out to an artist from the Museum of Northern Arizona to create a composite of the Jane Doe based on the features of her skull taken from the post-mortem examination pictures. They believe the new artist may be able to highlight the victim's features in a more professional way that would possibly catch the attention of someone who knew her. Once again, they used the national media to bring awareness to the case in the hopes that maybe one of the Jane Doe's children or family members may come forward after having not heard from them three decades. Again, they had no luck. Miller's investigative team also tried to find links to the company Deer Pack Ames Harris Neville and Co., which had produced the sack the victim had been found in, but discovered they had long since been bought out. Over the next 20 years, Miller and her team worked through the case periodically. They kept a watchful eye on databases and followed any and every tip and lead. If anything, their Jane Doe was the proverbial needle in the haystack. Investigators led by Miller also attempted to track down the make of the victim's clothes, but too many years had passed and the fashion range had all but disappeared. In November 2021, the case was officially registered to the NAMIS database but still there were no positive results. Again, investigators found themselves at a dead end with all leads exhausted. However, as a part of their ongoing case review, the sheriff's department continued to update their Facebook post regarding missing or unidentified persons. In October 2022, 51 years later after the Mojave Jane Doe was discovered, they were contacted by Othram Inc., a forensic genealogy company based in Texas, on their Facebook page. The company offered to use the new DNA technology being developed by geneticists to try and create a family tree based on their Jane Doe's DNA profile, but it would take time and money as the technology was new and expensive to carry out. Before that, though, investigators tried one more time to post the composite sketch on their Facebook page, hoping to find some tangible leads, but nothing worked out. Miller and her team had realized that there was only one way left, so basically, all we had left was to try to identify her through genetic genetic genealogy, she said. For the investigation team, the case became personal. She was someone's wife, daughter, or mother and it was possible she was missed. Over the years, the investigation continued to lodge evidence with no results. It became part of their mantra to close the Mojave Jane Doe case and bring closure not only to the family, but for those voiceless victims as well. It was with a fervent prayer that the investigators went ahead with the genetic testing option. The sheriff's office donated $1,000 towards the testing. Miller said that despite being a large county, their population was small and their budget was limited. Othram Inc., however, took it upon themselves to set up a donation page, requesting help from the public to raise the remaining $6,500 needed to begin testing. 
hoping the community would open their hearts to give the Mojave Jane Doe the dignity of her identity. DNA Solves assisted the crowdfunding initiative by creating a Dear Gladys page. The response was overwhelming. The story of the Mojave Jane Doe touched so many that within five days of starting the page, the remaining funds were raised and the testing could begin. The first thing investigators needed to do was exhumed the remains of Mojave Jane Doe. After being given the green light by the Mojave County Court in November 2022, excavation of the burial site began. Although the remains were in poor condition due to age, scientists were able to retrieve enough genetic material to perform the testing. The body was reburied as Othram Inc. prepared to begin the testing process. The technology was new and the process was long. It was trusted though as genetic genealogy tested had become popular in 2018 after it helped track down the Golden State Killer after more than 40 years. Using advanced DNA testing, the forensic grade genome sequencing investigators were able to create a DNA profile. This profile was then used to match against ancestry websites that have profiles from thousands of people who have willingly donated their DNA samples in order to trace and track families from around the world. Investigators were able to create several family trees based on the Mojave Jane Doe's DNA profile. Spending countless hours on the family trees, investigators tracked down several distant relatives and through the process of elimination, tracked down the closest living relatives. They eventually contacted a relative who was willing to provide a fresh DNA sample to assist in the investigation. It took another three months before any positive results were confirmed. On Monday, January 23, 2023, 52 years to the date on which the Mojave Jane Doe was discovered, lead investigator Lori Miller received the call she had been waiting for. They had a name. After a half century, the Jane Doe was discovered to be Colleen Audrey Rice. The news was first shared with the remaining relatives of Colleen before the announcement was made on the Mojave County Sheriff's Office Facebook page that same Monday afternoon. Colleen was born March 17, 1931, to parents James C. Rice and Flossie Truitt. She was raised in Portsmouth, Ohio, and is known to have a few family ties to Eastern Kentucky. It is unclear if she had any siblings. Colleen attended Portsmouth High School, but it was unknown if she graduated, as she married William Davis in 1946 at the young age of 15. After searching through old school records, investigators were able to obtain an old yearbook photo to attach her case file. Colleen would have been 39 years old at the time of her death. Little else was known about her personal life. Investigators who tracked down her living relatives did not garner much information as they were mostly distant relations of Colleen. What they did learn was that Colleen had become estranged from her family and husband. Although she showed signs of childbirth, there was no means of finding her children or records to prove if she had any at all. It seemed as if Colleen's life had been erased after she had disappeared. Investigators tried to find possible links to how Colleen arrived in Arizona, but that too dried up quickly. What they did know is that Colleen seemed to have been doing well for herself as she was well-groomed and healthy when her body was first discovered. Investigators had also tried to find out if she had changed her name to start a new life, away from her family, but the people in Kingman didn't seem to recognize her as well. Following the investigation, all legal work was completed to allow her living family members the chance to put her remains to rest. Her remains were exhumed and flown to Ohio in February 2023 to be buried alongside her family with a headstone bearing her name and date of birth and death. For investigators, their oldest case was finally gaining traction. They now knew who their victim was. Chief Development Officer at Othram Inc., Kristen Middleman, said it was a relief to finally have the name for the victim. It is heartwarming to witness law enforcement and the public come together to restore a murdered woman's name after a half century, she said. For the investigators, solving the crime became personal. They believed Colleen deserved better in death. She deserved dignity. Lead investigator Lori Miller kept a copy of the composite sketch taped to her computer as a daily reminder as to who and what they were fighting for while investigating the cold case. This was a Jane Doe. Now I have a name. She's always been a person. Now she's a person with a name. It kinda hits you, said Miller. According to news reports, 
Miller said that one of the challenges they faced in the investigation was finding people who were still around from when the incident first happened. It became quite daunting in the fact that we were trying to locate people that were still alive, she said. WOWK 13 News was able to find a distant relative of Colleen's, who also happened to be a genealogist himself. Eli Allen is related to Colleen from his mother's side of the family and currently lives in Ohio. Allen said that when he first heard about the case and discovered the name of the victim, he realized they were related. When I saw Rice, which is in my mother's line, I had to know we were related because it was that much more intimate, he said. When I saw Rice, which is in my mother's uh, line, have to know how we're related because it was that much more intimate. Identifying Colleen after more than 50 years is a testimony to the work he and so many others are doing. The more baffling question for investigators now is who killed Colleen and discarded her body in such an undignified manner. Autopsy reports did not find any foreign DNA on the victim's body at the time, and the possibility of assault was ruled out entirely. The theory of her being murdered by her husband was also ruled out as interview with the family suggested that Colleen had left of her own volition. No one who knew her personally at the time had seemed particularly interested in finding her, as there has never been a missing person report filed. In the 50-year period of the investigation, Colleen's murder had not been linked to any possible murderers who may have been active in the area around the 1970s. Her manner of death did not provide many clues either for investigators to determine patterns related to known serial killers at the time. Even though Colleen had been identified, the case remains ongoing. The SIU is still investigating in the hopes of finding the suspect or suspects responsible for Colleen's untimely death. Investigators are appealing to the public to come forward with any information regarding Colleen's murder and information about her life since she left her family behind in Ohio to start afresh in Arizona. The public is urged to contact the Mojave County Sheriff's Office Special Investigation Unit. The numbers will be provided in the description box below. On July 7, 1994, Blake Patton, the Forest Service's security supervisor, was informed that a woman hiking with her family had discovered a human skull close to the smokehouse campground off Forest Service Road, 402 Divide Road, Colorado. The campers discovered the head and jaw at Windy Point. The information was given to then-investigator Mike Wiggins and a necro team searching for bodies. The investigating team was made up of people from different areas. As officers looked around, they found more bones that belonged to a woman who stood about five feet, six inches tall. The woman's skull had clues to her identity, like gold crowns and signs of temporomandibular syndrome. There were signs of scoliosis in some parts of the spine. They also found the sacrum, the tailbone, parts of the arm and shoulder bones, and most of the right hip. Most of the bones that were found showed signs of being chewed on by carnivores. Various things were found near the body, such as a piece of a belt and a lock of hair that suggested she was either a brunette or a redhead. Investigators thought that some of the remains might have been concealed. What was left showed no signs of injury before death. The report from the autopsy said that a lot of the bones were still missing. Robert Pickering, a forensic anthropologist, agreed in September 1994 that the woman was at least 35 and possibly over 40, based on how her bones and teeth looked. Her face looked like it belonged to a Caucasian woman. Pickering even found grooves that pointed to a receding gum line, which could have been caused by using a toothpick at the time. He also found damage from carnivores in the form of pieces being broken off cracks and chewing. Pickering said that the person died within a year of when they were found. He told them, From what I understand, these bones were found on the ground, so it would have started to break down and be eaten by carnivores almost right away. The ID was the most important thing he couldn't figure out. William Rodriguez, who worked as a forensic anthropologist for the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in 1995, couldn't figure it out either. At the time, Canfield was the forensic pathologist at Montrose Memorial Hospital. He asked for a reconstruction of the face. William Rodriguez did the reconstruction and sent it back to Montrose with the bones and what little information he could get from them. 
He said that they didn't find any clues that would help with the investigation. They hoped facial reconstruction would help find the person who did this. But in reality, it did not do much. The investigators did their best, but they didn't find anything in the end. The detectives didn't give up hope as they kept working on the case and looking for new clues. But over time, no one could do anything about the case, and it became known as the Windy Point Jane Doe case. Investigators were still doing their best, but just like in the beginning, when they added the victim's DNA to the combined DNA index system, they found nothing. Over the years, DNA science and technology kept getting better and better. Canfield sent bone, dry tissue, and hair fragments to the CBI to see if they could be used to make a DNA profile. However, he said in 2008 that he had nothing that could be used to compare the samples to identify the dead person. As the years went by, Canfield and the police asked the public repeatedly for any clue, no matter how small, that could lead to the Windy Point Jane being identified. Even though there was a lot of publicity and a second facial reconstruction done in 2012, no new information solved the case. But DNA technology kept improving, and it was used in more places than just law enforcement and medicine. Canfield said that they would keep the proof until science had caught up with it. Before that, people who wanted to discover their possible ancestry could send a DNA sample to a business that did genealogy research. This became increasingly popular because it helped people find relatives and find out their family trees. It was also sometimes used by the police. Even though the investigators had her DNA, they were not able to run it through the genealogy website because it would have cost about $5,000 for this jurisdiction. In 2020, MCSO investigators Dustin Harlow and Brittany Martinez asked Lt. Ted Valerio for permission to send a DNA sample to the CBI for a family tree test. Valerio permitted them, and Lillard was happy to pay the $5,000 cost. In 2021, Lillard said that the CBI had chosen Windy Point as one of about 100 cold cases where forensic genetic genealogy would be used. They thought it might be a good idea. Then, on April 19th, the CBI called them. Liller said that they asked me if I was sitting down because they had some excellent news. After working hard and waiting, they finally found a match. He said that submissions to one of the commercial databases for which the CBI made the sample came from the sister and brother of the Hops family. With the DNA and dental records, forensic scientist Denise Venzel from the CBI confirmed that the remains were those of Susan Hops. The Windy Point Jane Doe was finally identified as Susan Hops. When the investigators met Susan's family, they learned who Susan Hops was. Susan was a licensed practical nurse and had lived in California since she was 11 years old. In the summer of 1991, when she was 41, she moved to Lakewood, Washington, with a woman who was said to be a possible roommate. In 1992, when she was 44, she was happy to buy a trailer. It was the first time she had lived on her own. At some point, they would be joined by a male friend. Even though she was far away from where she came from, she stayed in touch with her family. Because Susan's trailer was so important to her, it was strange that she would just abandon it. When the mobile home park owner came to her trailer to collect the rent, the door was wide open and trash was all over the place. The drawers were opened. Susan and her two roommates seemed to have left the trailer. Susan's family was from California, but she had an aunt and uncle in Washington who were worried about her. They always talked to Susan and said she lived a pretty calm life. They said she wasn't at high risk for something like this. They were confused about what actually happened to her. They said they started knocking on doors and asking people if they'd seen her. It was said that whatever they found out was strange, including details which had been kept from the public. 
Susan's family also put an ad in a newspaper saying that her father was very sick and that Susan should call them wherever she was. Sadly, no call ever came. Susan was 44 years old when she was last seen in Lakewood, Washington on August 9, 1993. It said that she and two other people left quickly for some reason. There was a chance that the identity of those two individuals was known, but it wasn't released. It looked like Susan had vanished into thin air. In 2003, her family hired a private investigator, but she could not be found. Amy Johnson was the private investigator who had been looking for her, and when Susan's brother or sister's DNA was finally found, she was notified. Amy was the one who put the information on GED Match, which was a good idea. Amy Johnson thought at first that the call from the Colorado number was spam, but when she heard the message, it was precisely what she had been looking for. After waiting for Susan for over 20 years, the message told her that the Windy Point's Jane Doe in Montrose County was really Susan. Susan had always been important to her. Amy never got paid for working on this case. Amy told the press that her goal had always been to help Susan get what was right. The best thing that could have happened was for her to be found. She said, I've never forgotten about her, even 20 years later. Her picture hangs in a place where I see her. I've always wondered, where are you? Since 2003, she had been looking into possible leads. Amy said that all of it was for Susan. She was a really wonderful person. She fell in with the wrong crowd. No one wanted a member of their family to be found on a hillside. This woman was kind and didn't deserve what happened to her. After years of hard work and dedication, Susan was found after 28 years, but the main point remains that her case is still being looked into, as the cause of death is believed to be murder, and the killer is yet to be found. On Saturday, December 10, 1988, the body of a young woman was found on Bayside Drive in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. It was on the bike path, and the people who cleaned it were the first to find it. They didn't waste much time and called the police right away. When the police arrived, they started looking around the whole area. When they talked to some people in the area, the police discovered that there was a cleanup event on Saturday along Bayside Drive. After the investigation was over, the police found a skeleton and some pieces of clothes and shoes, but they didn't know who the bones belonged to. Donna Fontana, a forensic anthropologist for the state of New Jersey, then looked at the remains and concluded that they belonged to a young white female between the ages of 15 and 18, who had probably been dead since the mid-1970s. Members of the MCPO and the Atlantic Highlands Police Department first looked into the case together. They used different methods of investigation, but none of them were able to find out the identity of the deceased. In the 1990s, a DNA profile was made from the bones and used to make comparisons, which also didn't work at first. In their investigation of this case, the police always came up with nothing, but they didn't give up looking. They were always talking to people in Atlantic Highlands, but they still couldn't get a break in this case. Eventually, the case turned cold, with no new leads. Then, in 2020, Lieutenant Andrea Tozzi and Detective Wayne Rayner of the MCPO contacted Bode Technology, a Virginia-based DNA analysis company, to look into the case using much more advanced technology than had been available before. The person who had been known only as Jane Doe for a long time was finally found to have a distant relative who lived in Georgia and was a woman. The relative agreed to an interview and then agreed to put DNA from her mother into the Bode's database, which led to the discovery of another lead. A Pennsylvanian woman was thought to be Jane Doe's youngest sister. The woman was talked to in August and agreed to give a DNA sample. The test results meant that there was a 99.9997% chance that Jane Doe was related to the person immediately. The Middlesex Regional Medical Examiner Office's Deputy Medical Examiner Dr. Lauren Thoma then looked at the new information 
and made it official that the remains were those of Nancy Fitzgerald. The investigation had been looking for this for decades. After that, Nancy Fitzgerald's relatives who were still alive were told, and her body was sent to them to be buried. Finally, the detectives could get in touch with them and talk to them. They learned more about Nancy Fitzgerald after that. Nancy Carol Fitzgerald was born in New Jersey and grew up in Essex County. Her mother and father had her in 1956. In 1968, her father died. Kathleen was the name of her sister. She moved from Crown Street to Moore Avenue in Bloomfield, New Jersey, with her mother and siblings. She went to Berkeley Elementary School and North Junior High School in Bloomfield. She was kicked out of school because of drug use at a young age. A person used to sell drugs to her and other girls in exchange for prostitution. In 1971, she overdosed and was rushed to a hospital by police. After being treated, when she was taken home, police found barbiturates in her bedroom that she was supposed to sell. On the 2nd of April, 1972, Nancy had Easter dinner with her family at their home in Bloomfield. This was the last time they had seen Nancy, because the next day, on the 3rd of April, she went missing. She was 16 years old at the time. On the night of the 3rd of April, her mother and sister called the police. The police began to look into it. When Nancy went missing, she was wearing knee-high socks, a lace-covered bra, and platform sandals with ankle straps made of leather. She regularly went to the dentist because she had a gap in her upper central incisors. After she had been gone for a year, her mother got a phone call from a strange girl. The girl had begged and screamed for help, saying, Mom, I made a big mistake. Come get me. Come get me help. Nancy's mother had thought she was Kathleen, as they had lost hope of finding Nancy by this time. But when Kathleen came home that night safely, her mother realized who it could have been. They contacted the police again, but just as in the past, the police couldn't find anything. Nancy's sister Kathleen traveled the country to search for Nancy over the years, but she also failed to find her sister. Finally, decades later, they got to know what happened to her in 2020 with the results of DNA testing. Raymond Santiago, the prosecutor from Monmouth County, said in a statement, Today's announcement results from decades of hard work by a network of people whose collective determination and creativity proved to be unstoppable. It's also a sign of our firm commitment to find the truth and serve the interests of justice. No matter how much time has passed or what obstacles might ever get in the way of an investigation. Fifty years later, thanks to modern DNA testings and interviews with far-off relatives in Georgia and Pennsylvania, authorities have confirmed that Fitzgerald's remains were located after all these years. The consistent development in forensic science and DNA testing is solving many unsolved cases around the world. We should be thankful to all the people behind this development. These two cases are just another example of it, but many cases are still unsolved after decades, and the families involved are still hoping for answers. Let's hope that they too get justice for their loved ones. On January 28, 2012, residents of a mobile home in Opelika, Alabama, found the remains of a little child in their backyard. No one knew how it had gotten there, and detectives would be mystified for more than 10 years until advanced DNA technology unraveled a family secret that no one was supposed to find out. So, what exactly could have happened to the poor innocent child? And how did her remains get to where they were found? Today's case will take us to Opelika, a city located in the east-central part of the state of Alabama. It is the capital city of the county of Lee and boasts a population of more than 30,000 people. Opelika is famous for the Robert Trent Jones Grand National Golf Course, which has been the venue for several national and other important golf competitions. Apart from this, the city is also popular for its vibrant art scene, historic downtown area, and other scenic tourist spots. Amore was born in Virginia on the 1st of January, 2006, to parents Sherry Wiggins and Lamar Vickerstaff. At the time of her birth, her mother Sherry was only 20, 
Lamar, on the other hand, was in his mid-thirties and was a military man serving with the Navy. She was a blessing. She was smart, and she was special, and that's why I named her Amore, which in Spanish means love, Sherry said of her daughter. Soon after Amore came into the world, Sherry's and Lamar's relationship took a hit. Something that made matters worse was the fact that Lamar's relatives had frowned on his romance with Sherry from the start. And when their affair eventually produced a child, they had more cause to be displeased. They were simply disappointed that Lamar now had a child out of wedlock. With the growing tension, Sherry had no other choice but to take Amore and move out of the apartment she and Lamar shared. This was in 2006. She began to take care of her daughter on her own and got little to no help from Lamar with maintaining their daughter's well-being. Shortly after this, Lamar got married to another woman and moved on with his life. Sherry was hurt and decided to drag Lamar to court in order to at least get child support from him for Amore. But things didn't go as planned. Sherry had some legal troubles of her own, and this proved to be her undoing. At that time, I was making some bad decisions and some bad choices in my life where I did have some run-ins with the law. Due to this, the court system labeled her as unstable and decided that Amore would be better off in the care of Lamar. In addition to this, the court also directed Sherry to begin paying child support to Lamar, since he was to begin caring for Amore. And so, in 2009, when Amore was about three years old, she permanently went to live with her father and his wife, Ruth. It did make sense for her to be somewhere more stable, Sherry said. Even though Amore had been taken away from her custody, she ensured that she played an active role in the little girl's life, and would occasionally visit her at Lamar's residence. However, this soon came to an end. Lamar was transferred to Hawaii by the Navy, and he had to move there with his family. Due to this, Amore was now even farther away from her mother. Sherry was saddened by this unexpected occurrence, and over the years, she went to court to try and regain custody of Amore, but it was all to no avail. At some point, she was told she could no longer appeal the case, and this meant that Amore would continue to remain in the care of her father till she turned 18. I felt like they made me feel so bad about myself. I kept trying and the doors kept being closed. I felt like the best I could do was live out my financial obligation, which I never stopped. I felt like one day I could tell her, I never gave up on you, and all I could do was take care of you financially, and that is what I did. If I couldn't do anything, I could care for my daughter by supporting my child financially, Sherry said. Despite how everything turned out, Sherry kept hoping that one day she would see her child again. But sadly, this would never happen. At around 10.47 a.m. on January 28, 2012, the Opelika Police Department received a call from a resident of a mobile home community located at 1775 Hearst Street in Opelika, Alabama. The call was about a discovery that was strange and disturbing. The skull of a human being had been found outdoors. Police officers quickly jumped into their vehicles and made their way to the scene. When they got there, they were met by the person who had placed the emergency call. The individual was a woman named Yvonne Johnson, and she wasted no time in explaining to the officers that her son had been the one who found the skull in their backyard. According to Yvonne, the skull had not been there a day before and its sudden appearance had been startling. After she told them this, she led officers to the back of the mobile home to see for themselves, and true enough, lying on the ground in plain sight was a skull. It was quite small, and they could tell by just looking at it that it was a child's. In addition to this, officers also noticed that it had a few strands of hair on it. Its presence there was odd, and officers could not help but wonder where the rest of the body was. The area was quickly secured and detectives were notified. When they got to the scene, they immediately did a sweep of the mobile home community. The aim of this was to see if they could find any more skeletal remains, but nothing turned up. With the day getting dark, detectives were forced to give up their search for the day. It wasn't until two days after the shocking discovery that detectives were able to locate some human remains. These were found in the woods, several feet away from where the skull had been found. Detectives also found a pink long-sleeved shirt with ruffles and heart-shaped buttons alongside the remains. 
All of these were collected and then sent to the lab for forensic analysis. Finding out the identity of the child shot to the top of the list of priorities for the detectives. Forensic analysis and autopsies were performed on the remains at an FBI laboratory located in Quantico. There, it was discovered that it belonged to a black female, and she was speculated to have died between 2010 and 2011. Her age was estimated to be between 4 and 7 years old, and in addition to this, the medical examination also revealed something chilling. The deceased girl had previously suffered several broken bones that were already healing before she died. Her bones also indicated that she had been malnourished while alive. That was not all. A fracture was also noticed in her left eye socket, and this made detectives believe that she had been blind in the left eye. They speculated that this facial deformity would have been obvious to anyone while she was alive. In the end, her death was ruled a homicide, and detectives immediately began an investigation. They had no idea who she was, but they were determined to uncover her identity. Since they could not tell what name she had been given, they decided to call her Opalika Baby Jane Doe. Since that day, Baby Jane has been part of our OPD family, said Opalika Police Chief Shane Healy. One of the first things detectives tried to do was develop a DNA profile for the deceased girl, but the conditions of the remains made this impossible. When this failed, detectives began to review thousands of school and birth records, but their efforts yielded no result. There was no record of any missing child around the age of the deceased girl, and no one came forward for a long time to provide any useful information about her. Things would remain silent until 2016. That year, a forensic artist from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children was able to come up with sketches of what baby Jane might have looked like before her death. The sketches showed her dressed in a pink shirt with heart-shaped buttons. This was similar to the clothing that was found near her remains. These sketches were then released to the public with the hopes that someone would recognize her. Several weeks went by after this and nothing came up. But when they least expected, they got a very crucial piece of information from someone. This was in September 2016. The individual who came forward to provide the information had been a former Bible school teacher at a church known as the Greater Peace Baptist Church. The church was located in Opelika and was less than a 15-minute drive from where the skeletal remains had been found. According to the former Bible school teacher, she had seen a young girl back in 2011 who looked like baby Jane. The teacher told detectives that the girl had looked slightly unkempt and had been unable to communicate fluently with other children, and because of this, she had mostly kept to herself. When asked if she remembered the girl's name, she told them that she didn't. With this information, detectives went to the church and took a look at the photographs that had been taken back in 2011. After going through several photos, they came upon the picture of the little girl that had been described by the teacher. Detectives could immediately see that her description fitted perfectly with that of baby Jane. She had an obvious deformity in her left eye, just like they had speculated from examining baby Jane's remains. The photos that were obtained from the church were a bit blurry, and so they had to use special software to enhance them. These photos were then released to the public. The following year, detectives employed the help of the University of South Florida to perform a procedure known as isotope testing on baby Jane's remains. This method involves analyzing the number and type of isotopes present in a sample, which can provide information about the age, origin, and composition of materials. After the test was done, it was discovered that the deceased girl had a higher amount of lead in her system, and this indicated that she may have been raised in Alabama or somewhere in the southeast. Everybody has a certain amount of lead, and it depends on where you are raised, what type of drinking water you've had, said Opelika Police Captain Jonathan Clifton. Several months went by after this, and detectives had nothing to go on. However, they never relented and were determined not to leave any stone unturned. To them, the case was like a black cloud that loomed over the community, and solving it was sure to bring a sense of fulfillment. In January 2022, the Opelika Police Department partnered with Othram Laboratories to carry out advanced DNA testing on the remains. They had not been successful in carrying out a DNA test on the bones in the past, but they believed that advances in the world of forensic science would make it possible. They were very difficult skeletal remains to actually create a profile from. 
especially the kind of profile that you need to do genealogy, said Kristen Middleman, Chief Development Officer at Othram Labs. The lab used a unique technique known as forensic-grade genome sequencing and was able to finally extract DNA from the remains. After doing this, the DNA was then used to build a profile for the girl and it was then uploaded to the database. With this in place, detectives sought the help of a renowned and experienced genealogist by the name of Dr. Barbara Ray Venter. Over several weeks, Dr. Barbara and her team, Firebird Forensic Group, worked round the clock to try and identify close relatives of the deceased girl using the DNA profile that had been created. Their hard work eventually paid off because in October 2022, they were able to determine who the girl's father was. It was a moment of joy for detectives because they had finally made a discovery that had evaded them for more than 10 years. It was a large piece of the puzzle that had finally been resolved. As for the girl's father, he was none other than Lamar, the naval officer who fathered a child with Sherry back in 2006. Detectives would not know until later that baby Jane was actually Amore, Lamar and Sherry's child. When detectives did a background check on Lamar, they discovered that he was still alive and was in the process of retiring from the Navy. They also found out that he was stationed in Jacksonville, and they decided to visit him there to inform him about the death of his daughter. In December 2022, detectives traveled to Naval Station Mayport in Jacksonville. They hoped that Lamar would provide them with details about his daughter. However, this ended up not being the case. After they met Lamar, he was strangely unwilling to talk about the little girl and avoided every question thrown at him. This immediately raised suspicion in the minds of detectives, but there was nothing they could do at that point. The meeting with Lamar did not go as expected, but this did little to discourage detectives. Instead, they intensified their investigation and also discovered that Lamar had a wife, Ruth. They eventually met with her, but just like her husband, she provided no helpful information. However, she told detectives that she had no idea who Lamar's daughter was or who the mother could have been. Detectives knew from that moment that they had to find out who the little girl's biological mother was. Dr. Barbara and her team got to work once again, and soon they were able to determine that the woman they were looking for was Sherry. It was also discovered that she was living in Maryland. Detectives traveled down there, and during the course of the meeting they had with Sherry, they got to find out a lot. She told them that she gave birth to a girl back in 2006, and she had named her Amore. However, she expressed shock upon hearing that Amore had been dead for more than a decade. She explained to detectives that she had lost custody of the child to the father, Lamar, and when Lamar moved to Hawaii, she no longer had any contact with her daughter. When she had reached out to Lamar, his response had been cold, and he had warned her not to call again. During the course of all this, I would still reach out. I would reach out via email over the years, and they would block my email accounts, Sherry said. I called Lamar's number that I knew to be his, and he told me that if I called again, he would block me from his phone, she added. She continued to call, and Lamar stayed true to his words by blocking her, and at some point, he even threatened her with the police. Despite the fact that she had not laid eyes on her daughter for years, she told detectives that she continued to pay child support and had till the end of 2022. To back up her claim, she showed them documents that contained detailed information about the child support. The shock written on the faces of the detectives was quite visible after Sherry finished telling her side of the story. They could hardly believe their ears. After getting back to their base, they began to reach out to the school boards as well as clinics located in the states Lamar and Ruth had resided in after they gained custody of Amore. By doing this, they were able to discover that Amore was never enrolled in any school. There was also no record to show that the couple reported the little girl missing. This was all the confirmation they needed to know that Lamar and Ruth had something to do with her death. On January 17, 2023, the couple was arrested in Jacksonville and held at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Lamar was charged with felony murder and Ruth with failure to report a missing child. Two days after this, a press conference was organized and Opelika Police Chief Shane provided in-depth details regarding the case. He also expressed his gratitude to all those who had contributed in one way or the other to ensure that the case got solved. The level of dedication to this case I have never seen in my entire career. To see a group of men and women come together searching for a name 
Many of us said that we did not want to leave our time at this police department until we had her name. And now we do. Amore Wiggins, Shane had said. Sherry, on the other hand, remains grateful to the detectives for their dedication to the case, and she wants to see justice served. She was just a baby. They deprived her of everything. She was a child, Sherry said. At the moment, the case remains open, and detectives continue to gather additional information in regards to Amore's relationship with Lamar and Ruth. Lamar's and Ruth's fate also remains to be determined. Amore certainly suffered terrible abuse and neglect before her death, but thankfully the long hand of the law has caught up with those involved in such an evil act. It's still yet unknown how Amore died, but how do you think that happened? And to what extent do you think Lamar and Ruth contributed to her death? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe.